thank you all for coming. We're going to do a little bit of uh, a preview of the bluegrass band that's going to play on uh, Sunday over here at Rocky Hollow. We're going to have brunch in between the two services, 9 and 11. And so, uh, so we'll give you a little preview of this. We want you to sing along on a little bit of Jingle Bells, okay? Here we go. Y'all ready? One, two, three. Sing it with us. Uh. Jingle bells, jingle bells, jingle all the way. Oh, what fun it is to ride in a one-horse open sleigh. Hey, jingle bells, jingle bells, jingle all the way. Oh, what fun it is to ride in a one-horse open sleigh. Dashing through the snow in a one-horse open sleigh. Over the fields we go, laughing all the way. Oh, the cocktails ring, making spirits bright. What fun it is to ride and sing a sleigh song tonight. Oh, jingle bell, jingle bell, jingle all the way. Oh, what fun it is to ride in a one-horse open sleigh. Hey, jingle bell, jingle bell, jingle all the way. Oh, what fun it is to ride in a one-horse open sleigh. Take it away, Betty. Sing it with us here. Jingle bells, jingle bells, jingle all the way. Oh, what fun it is to ride in a one horse open sleigh. Hey, jingle bells, jingle bells, jingle all the way. Oh, what fun it is to ride in a one horse open sleigh. Oh, what fun it is to ride in a one horse open sleigh. Thank you. Thank you so much. Go tell it on the mountain, all right? Here we go. Go tell it on the mountain, over the hills and everywhere. Go tell it on the mountain that Jesus Christ is born. While shepherds kept their watching, or silent flocks by night. Behold, throughout the heavens there shone a holy light. Oh, go tell it on the mountain, over the hills and everywhere. Go tell it on the mountain that Jesus Christ is born. The shepherds feared and trembled when low above the Sing it with us. Down in a lowly manger, the humble Christ was born. And God sent out his nation, that blessed Christmas born. Go tell it on the mountain, over the hills and everywhere. Go tell it on the mountain, that Jesus Christ is born. Sing that again. Go tell it on the mountain. Over the hills and everywhere Go tell it on the mountain That Jesus Christ is born That Jesus Christ is born Thank you. Joy to the world, the Lord has come. We're going to change keys here. And I always tell folks we tune because we care, right? For you. For you. <laughs> we wore all our teeth tonight for you. You got yours in? All right, I 
see a lot out there. I see a lot of pearly smiles. That's a joke that only goes over in Arkansas, you know. My dad's from Arkansas. No, if you're our age, my grandmother at night, when I'd spend the night at her house and I'm like a little kid, and she'd take out her teeth and put them in that little dish next to How the bed. How many grandparents that did that? Oh, <laughs> no. It was kind of scary. See there, How many of y'all do there. that? No. <laughs> <laughs> Here we go. Ready? Y'all ready? Memories. Here we go. Oh, joy to the world, the Lord is come. Let earth receive. Repeat the sounding joy, repeat the sounding joy, repeat, repeat the sounding joy. Try a little bit of you. Christy, did you hear about the elderly couple that were sitting in the restaurant eating one night? I think it was a Friday night. They were eating, and uh, just one of them, uh, the, the wife, was, was eating. Mm -hmm. And uh, the waitress came and said, uh, what, what's the problem with your meal, sir? You, you don't like it? And he said, um, we, we, we only have one set of teeth, <laughs> and it, it, it's her turn to go first. <laughs> we're in Arkansas now. I also heard about the first grade, first grade teacher, Christy, keep, that was uh, trying to teach a little boy, Johnny, how to, how to add, you know, just oh, okay. two plus two plus two. And she said, now, um, little Johnny, uh, if I gave you two cats and gave you two more cats and gave you two more cats, how many cats would you have? And he said, seven. No, 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 Johnny, let, let me say it again. If I gave you two cats and then I gave you two more cats and two more cats, how many would you have? Seven. She said, no, 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 Johnny. Let, let, me get, let me try it a different way. If I gave you two apples and two more apples and two more apples, how many apples would you have? Six. Oh, you got it now. So let me go back. Two cats. I give you two more cats and I give you two more cats. How many cats you got? Seven. She said, oh, Johnny, what is it? He said, well, already got one at the house. <laughs> <laughs> that is genius. Yeah. From Arkansas. Mm, 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 mm. So we're, we're in the Sermon on the Mount, and uh, just one more thing before we get into the serious part of it. You know, we got you tethered. Uh, well, one more thing before we get into the serious matters. I, I think I discovered a new definition of hypocrite tonight. Those of you who sing uh, Jingle Bells and White Christmas, and you escape the snow to come to Texas. That's a hypocrite. Yeah. You don't love a white Christmas or you wouldn't be here, right? Get away from that stuff. 
Well, we are in the middle of the Sermon on the Mount. You know, when I started this process, I thought we, we're going to just journey with Jesus and we're going to be on the move all the time. Well, this Sermon on the Mount sort of stalled us out, didn't it? But my goodness, isn't it good? It is rich, rich, rich. I'm learning some things um, from my restudy of the Sermon on the Mount. I trust that you are too. Don't know how far we'll get tonight. Does anybody know where we're supposed to start tonight? Good, I'm going to start on chapter 6. I hope you'll go with me there. Yeah. Chapter 6. Matthew chapter 6 it is. Yeah. Three chapters in the Sermon on the Mount, 5, 6, and 7. And so we're, on, we're about a third of the way through. Somebody said, uh, um, told me this afternoon that we were going to quit December the 18th. And, and what, weren't we going to do something after that? Um, we are going to quit on December the 18th because the next Wednesday would be December 25th. And I don't think you will want to be, well, you'll probably want to be here, but you pr probably have some other place you need to be. And then the next Wednesday would be January the 1st, and you, you're probably going to be too full, too full. You thought I was going to say hung over, didn't you? Mm -hmm. uh, so we'll come um, the 18th, and then we won't be here on the 25th and the 1st, and we'll start back. Where will we start? Wherever we stop this week the, on the 18th, we'll pick back up. Because we're on a journey with Jesus. We're trying to follow him. And it's, it's very difficult, I, I'm finding, but a lot more difficult than I thought it would be when I started out, to follow him um, chronologically and geographically. Uh, because the, that's not what the gospel writers were intending to do when they, when they were inspired by God's Spirit to write the, the gospels. That, that wasn't what they were trying to do. They weren't, weren't offering a day-by-day um, a, a -day, um, diary of what Jesus did and taught. Uh, they're trying to communicate who he was as the Messiah and, yes, what he taught. And so they, they arranged it you know, differently than what we would, might want them to do. So it's, it's a struggle. So when we get out of the Sermon on the Mount, and I'm, I'm, I'm confident that we will get out of the Sermon on the Mount this year. I think yeah, we're going to have to, yeah. Uh, maybe I'm less confident now that I heard your moan. But, yeah. um, but uh, when, when we get out of the Sermon on the Mount, then I think we'll, we'll start moving, um, moving about more and see more pictures of, of the geography and the, the things that we'll see on the trip to Israel. All right, all minds at ease. Yeah. What about that dessert? Oh, my goodness. I told Coletti, I said, wherever you found that recipe, uh, hang on to it. That's pecan pie cobbler. I thought that was good even without the bluebell. Did you all get the bluebell? Mm. Next time we want bluebell, right? Somebody tell Coletti that. We want bluebell. Mm. Oh, you want me to tell her? Mm -hmm. I will. I will. Yeah. Well, it's um, been a tough week. You know, we've, we, uh, in the past week, we've had four more of our family going home to be with the Lord and um, making preparations for their celebration of life and stuff. And, uh, a lot of things going on. Family meeting we had today, uh, one Sunday here at Rocky Hollow. A lot, of, a lot of things going on. Wonderful women's meeting last night, wasn't it? Yeah, those of you? Man, what a wonderful drama that they put on music and stuff. Uh, Excellent. Yeah. Good things happening. Good things happening. Well, let's pause and pray, and then we'll get into Matthew chapter 6. Father, we thank you for all that you are to us. You are our Lord. You're our creator. You're our father. You're our great physician. You're our healer. You're our hope. You're our confidence. You're the you're the spring of water welling up within us. Lord, you are our all in all. We come to worship you tonight. Lord, we want to know you better. We, we are confident that as we know you better, our faith will grow. We'll trust you more because we know you better. And you'll be able then to, to live your life more fully in us and through us because 
we trust you more. And you'll be able to touch the world with your love through us and our activities because you have more rule and reign in our life. Help us to be submissive to you, to your word, to your spirit, and uh, just, just to be good disciples, becoming more like our Lord Jesus, our rabbi every day. Lord, we pray for our family, those, those who are hurting, struggling, uh, whether it be themselves or uh, struggling with uh, loved ones, and medical issues, physical things, uh, emotional problems, uh, some financial problems perhaps, and uh, just all, all the things that make life difficult. Lord, we know that you redeem all that you allow, so we pray, Father, that uh, you'll help us to grow through all these difficult circumstances that come our way. We trust you, and we want to trust you more. And so help us, Lord, we pray, as we open your word, we open our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. We're in chapter 5 of, no, excuse me, 6 of the book of Matthew. And again, Matthew 5 starts out with uh, Jesus, I, I think they're at or near um, Capernaum, right on the Sea of Galilee. He sees a crowd of people, and in response to that crowd that... I'm making the assumption, this it's, it's is a hypothesis, an educated guess, uh, um, I'm, I'm making the assumption that he saw the crowd, he's got his disciples with him, but he saw the crowd, and um, th they're, they're looking for him already, because he's, he's already becoming known, and so he goes up on the mountainside. Um, those mountains, mm, I, I would say they're more like the hill country uh, than mountains like in Colorado. Um, so he, he goes up on the hillside, the mountainside, and begins to teach. Sat down and began to teach. I think he, he probably has his disciples right there at his feet and the crowd all on the hillside. And he's, he's sat down and began to teach them. And he, he shares with them what we call the Sermon on the Mount. It's all about the kingdom of heaven, how things are different in the kingdom of heaven. And as I said before, I, I think too that he is, he's presenting his yoke. That is, it's his understanding, his interpretation, his application of God's law, Ten Commandments uh, t to his people, Israel. He's, in, he's giving them his, um, as a rabbi, his teacher, he's giving them his, his application of the law. And in so doing, he, he says, for example, um, well, you know, you've, you've heard it said all along, you know, but I tell you. And so he's, he's, he's uh, setting the record straight. He's saying, here's what you're going to hear from me. And he's setting the stage for his three years of ministry. We get to chapter uh, 6, and he's, he's talking about uh, righteousness, righteousness. Um, as I understand it, this word, either in Hebrew or Greek, Old Testament, New, uh, this word uh, f translated righteousness or, uh, here is used some 700 times. Now you would say that, that's, that must be an important word used that many times. And it is, it is. Um, so we, we, could, we could spend a week or two just talking about what does righteousness mean. Um, I, I boil it all down to to be in a right relationship with God and with others. Righteousness. Um, that is um, a state or a status of being right with God. Some people call it right wise. Um, it, it is being obedient, right? It's, it's responding to God's law, God's direction, God's guidance in living. Living in a way that pleases God, certainly. Um, in fact, I, I looked it up in the International Standard Bible Encyclopedia Revised Edition, and it says this, I quote, The righteous person is one whose life has been freed from the power of sin by the cross of Jesus Christ. In other words, you've been set free by the life the death, the, the giving of the life of Jesus Christ to it. In other words, we have his life in us, making us righteous. And thus, true righteousness can be only be linked to God's revelation in Christ. You want to be right with God? Uh, come to Christ. He can, he can give you, he can make you right with God. So righteousness 
is uh, in relationship to God in Christ and even in the face of our sin. Anybody here sinless? Uh, you know, there, there have been some Christians who believe that they could reach a state of sinlessness. I, 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 I haven't sensed that for myself, for sure. Um, but, but when I stand before God, um, I, I stand in his righteousness, right? Not, not in my own. I'm, I'm not saying I am uh, absolutely morally perfect, although we did read last week, the end of chapter 5, be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. And, and I, may have, um, I may have, in some ways, watered that down Sunday when I talked about that word perfect. Um, it has the meaning of uh, wholeness, maturity, but it also carries that idea, that connotation, that a application of, you know, being without error, without sin. And, and that's what God is calling us to. In fact, if you want to go to heaven, heaven is a perfect place. If you want to go to heaven, you need to be perfect, right? How are you going to get there? If you're imperfect, well, that's the blood. The blood of Christ covers our sin. Our, and not just our sinful behaviors, our sin nature. That is, um, that brokenness in us. So the true righteousness in Christ, uh, God has granted to us righteousness in Christ. And listen to Paul, 2 Corinthians 5, 21. God made him who had no sin to be sin so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Um, here's what Jesus taught in the Sermon on the Mount. Um, again, it's by faith, uh, believing, trusting. Uh, and for me, uh, I, I have come to understand the word faith, believe, trust in the New Testament perspective um, to have a, a sense of um, opening. If, if, I, if I trust you, then I open myself up to you. I allow you to influence, flow into, influence me. I'm trusting you just as you are trusting me now. If you didn't trust me, you'd get up and walk out. If you didn't trust me, you wouldn't be here tonight. So you, so you have some confidence, some faith in me that I am speaking God's truth, rightly dividing the word. Yeah. And so um, when we faith, trust, believe God, we're opening our lives up to him and allowing his life to flow into us. It's not just all up here. It's, it's all of who we are. It's not just mental it is holistic. So Jesus said in 6.1, be careful. And we're talking about real righteousness. And, and there, Jesus is going to talk about um, true righteousness, real righteousness. And he's going to talk about self-righteousness. And he's, he's going to point some fingers and say, y you folks are acting uh, self-righteously. You, you you're proud of who you are and what you do. And, and um, really, you should... Think about that. So six one says, be careful not to practice your righteousness. Think about that. That's something good to meditate on when you go for a walk tomorrow. Practice your righteousness. Now, it, be careful not to put a period there. Be careful not to practice your righteousness. That's, listen to the rest. Don't practice your righteousness in front of others to be seen by them. Because if you do, you have no reward from your Father in heaven. So when you do practice your righteousness, how do you do that? Giving to the needy, for example. Don't announce it with trumpets, you know. Don't wave your check in the air before you put it in the plate. <laughs> because that's what hypocrites do. They do it in the synagogues so everybody can see, right? They do it on the streets to be honored by others. And truly, I tell you, they have received their reward in full. If they're doing it to be seen by others, then getting seen by others is all you're going to get. God's not going to bless you for that. But let me tell you how you ought to do it. Let me tell you how, how you can do it rightly if you want God's blessing. If you want to do, in a, in a, do it from the heart 
because you're doing it for the right reason. You're doing it for a godly reason. You're doing it in a righteous way. That is, he says, when you give to the needy, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing so that your giving may be in secret. And then your father, who sees uh, what is done in secret, will reward you. Now remember, we talked about the, uh, the religion of Jesus' day seemed to be focused a lot on... Um, um, deeds of righteousness uh, for, for reward. I'm doing this to get something. I give, I help people to get, you know, uh, what, what do you call that, altruism? Yeah. Just do, uh, someone said there's no such thing as, as altruism, that just doing it because it's the right thing to do. Because anytime we do something, and, and even if we do it because it's just the right thing to do, uh, I think, uh, this is my, uh, my, my assumption, is it makes us feel good. It makes, you, it makes me feel good to do something for other people. Does it make you feel good? Yeah. Well, is that your motive for doing it? I hope not. But you do get something out of it. But the Lord is saying, um, um, d don't do it in order to get other people's... Uh, oh, you're a good person because you gave to the caring place or the worship place but you're good but no 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 that that's not the that's not the right attitude to have don't let your left hand know what your right hand is doing now i i have difficulty with that i sometimes my left hand can't remember what my right hand did but it seems that my right hand and left hand they they always know what the other is doing what, what is Jesus, he's using some language here to, to uh, emphasize the point, right? I mean, can you n not know, uh, exaggerate, we call it hyperbole, overstatement, exaggeration, getting the point across so that um, you hear what he's saying. Uh, you know, this idea of, of remembering things, we preachers like to, you know, alliterate things and have everything start with a B or whatever. Uh, it, we want to help people remember well, Jesus used some of that same kind of uh, language tactics too to get, just get, get people to remember so that when you uh, get down the road a ways, the journey, and you have opportunity to give to someone in need, oh yeah, I remember Jesus said, uh, you know, do, do this privately. Don't, don't let everybody see it so they'll think you're such a good person. Just let it be between you and the Father. And your father who sees you doing that, he knows it. And your reward's coming. May not be immediate, but be assured it's coming. So kingdom people act like the king, right? Jesus is talking about here's what the kingdom folks look like. And the, they act like the king in the kingdom. The way the, 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 the uh, culture of the day took care of people in need... They didn't send them down to the caring place. They didn't have one. Didn't send them down to the local social security office, you know, social administration, all that kind of... They, they gave to the poor. And many of those poor might line up, you know, out at the, at, in front of the synagogue or the temple, you know, in and, and hopes that someone's coming to worship God might see their need and, and help people out. That's how they survive. And so uh, he's uh, this almsgiving thing, they call it. Jesus considered not, not only what we give to be important, but, but why we give. Let it be because that's who you are as a person. When you get to the place, remember the Beatitudes, when you get to the place when you're a kingdom person, your heart will simply, your heart will be compassionate toward those in need. You won't have to have somebody tell you, um, now you need to give to that person or this person. It, it, your heart's going to tell you that. When we give to make ourselves look good, that's all we're going to get. Jesus called it self-righteousness. And it'll get you nowhere. Uh, today's equivalent of, of this, this kind of concept of uh, giving and getting might be uh, giving in order to get a tax deduction. Well, if you give in order to get a tax deduction, you've got your reward. Did I just mess up right there? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
But that motive, uh, if you're giving to get, is, is selfish. It's for your own good, and you'll get what you deserve. Um, if it's not for the glory of God, then there's no eternal reward to it at all. So what does this saying mean? Don't let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. Uh, it, I think it's a, maybe a bit of humor that Jesus liked to use some humor. He, he says you, you strain at a gnat and swallow a camel. You ever seen a camel go through the eye of a needle? <laughs> you should laugh a little bit. Hmm. Let God take care of the praise. Uh, it, it, it is in his way of doing it right. God does not toot his own horn whenever he does something good for us, does he? So we ought to be like him. Do good things because you're a good person. Not to be good in the eyes of other people. It's a, it's a matter of our... Uh, Reputation versus character. Remember what, what I said a few weeks ago? I've said it a number of times. My understanding of what it means to glorify God is when we do something, say something, act in such a way that God's reputation, that's what people think of him, gets moved up toward his character. That's who he really is, right? So when we, when we act in such ways that people think more highly of God, we're glorifying him. Um, and so... When we act in ways that our reputation becomes more like God's reputation, that's a good thing. So Jesus repeats the same lesson on practicing your righteousness, uh, not only about um, almsgiving, and, but now he's talking about praying. How do you practice your righteousness? Well, you, you, certainly you're going to pray, right? If you're a righteous person, you're going to pray. But how you pray is important. How you pray is important. So he says, uh, when you pray, don't be like the hypocrites. We know who they are. For they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the street corners so that people can see them, right? And truly, I tell you, they've received their reward in full. But here's how you can pray rightly. When you pray, go into your room, close the door, and pray to your Father who is unseen, and then your father, who sees what is uh, done in secret, he'll reward you. And when you pray, don't keep on babbling like pagans. They think that they'll be heard because of their many words. Don't be like them, for your father knows what you need before you ask him. So this then is how you, how you should pray. N notice he didn't say this is what you should pray. He said this is how you should pray. And we know that prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. I like to say, uh, be in me as it is in heaven, right? Give us today our daily bread. He's probably talking to poor people. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our debts or trespasses as we also have forgiven our uh, debtors or trespasses against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For if you forgive other people when, you, when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But, here he's doing it opposite this time. He's giving you the positive and then the negative. But if you do not forgive others their sins, your Father will not forgive your sins. In other words, we, we, we need to always be about relationships, repairing broken relationships. Forgiving. You cannot receive God's blessings with a closed fist. As long as you hang on to that unforgiveness, that trespass, God can't take it away. But when we open our hands and our hearts, our lives to God and say, here I am, Lord, forgive me, we can forgive our, bro our brothers and sisters. Um, hypocrisy is acting outwardly that does not reflect the inward character. Uh, G Jesus will talk later about um, a wolf in sheep's clothing. That, that's a hypocrite, isn't it? Covered up to be, pretending to be something that you're not. And so if you're praying, you know, standing up in the synagogue and pray, or if you're standing out on the street corners where others can hear, eloquent, long, lengthy. Do you know somebody complained recently about my praying? It was one of those 
an anonymous complaint. They say, I, I pray too long. I say, I'm sorry that you feel that way. I think that's one of the most important things we do when we gather to pray. But don't pray just to be heard by others. One of the greatest compliments I ever heard about my friend and mentor was that to hear him, to overhear him, to listen to him pray um, made you feel like you were intruding on a private conversation. Now that's how it ought to be. You pray into God, not to be heard by others. You, you hear about the, uh, the fellow who, who complained that he couldn't hear the preacher praying. You know, and the preacher said, well, I wasn't praying to you. <laughs> Why do we pray? Um, pray because we, have, we love the Father. We want to speak to him. And in our worship time, we pray uh, because one person will lead all of us in a we, you, we unite our hearts and our spirits and, and um, pray in one accord, right? But I, I'm making the assumption, I, I, I hope I am true, I pray that, that you're praying during the time of worship. You know, you don't have to close your eyes to pray. But that you're praying. I, I know that some of you are praying for me while I'm preaching. Pray and I'll hurry up and get through. But if you pray into, for others to hear you, uh, and that's your intent, that's, that's what you're looking for, you, you get a blessing from that, then that's what you're going to get, and that's all. You, your prayer don't, doesn't make it any higher than the ceiling. <laughs> so hypocrisy, don't, don't, be a, don't be a hypocrite. That's what he calls them. Um, people who want to be, don't be like the hypocrite. They love so, uh, just like with almsgiving, our righteous praying is going to be private, does not, meet, does not need to be public prayer. Don't, does not mean that we ought not pray in public. But what's our intent in praying in public? Is it to be heard by others or is it leading? Note that Jesus said this is how we should pray. You know, some people think that, you know, if you just repeat these words, these are like a magic um, spell or something. Repeat the Lord's Prayer and it, it has some magical... No. If you don't pray this from the heart, all it is is words. Fall flat as a flitter. The heart must be involved in our praying. And so it, it's a model. Some people call it the model prayer. Um, I, I don't see that there's any special grace given to us when we repeat these words like a magic spell. However, I am convinced that uh, if, we, if we're praying from the heart and we're praying in one voice, um, that our Father is blessed. Our Father in heaven. I don't know if we're going to make it through the Sermon on the Mount by the end of the year, but uh, he says, um, uh, you... you you can also uh, fast in the right way or the wrong way. Now, um, someone has come up recently, I think one of you shared with me about this new, new thing, not new at all, called in intermittent fasting. In other words, you don't eat breakfast. Um, that works easy for me. I, I don't have to have breakfast. Um, fasting. Is it, why do you fast? Is it for religious reasons? Is it for uh, medical, you know, health reasons? Is it because you don't have any food to eat? I mean, fasting is when you pause what you would normally do, eating, and, and but why are you doing that? Jesus said, you know, there's some hypocrites that they, they do it for the wrong reason. They do it for, for themselves, for their own glory, and it goes nowhere. In fact, here's what he says. When you fast, now he's making the assumption these are Jewish people, they're going to fast. That's a part of their culture, part of their tradition. He says, when you fast, do not look somber as the hypocrites do. There they are again. They're everywhere, aren't they? Somebody's told me the church was full of hypocrites. I said, no, it's not. We've got empty seats over here and there. These hypocrites, they disfigure their faces to show others they're fasting. Oh, I'm hungry. 
And truly, I tell you, they have received their reward in full. When somebody looks at you and they hear you going, mm, stomach's growling. <laughs> Fasting for the Lord. Bless you, my son. You've gotten your reward. That's it. That's all you're going to get. Um, so when you fast, again, the assumption that you're going to, uh, I, I, I don't see a lot of evidence that Jesus taught us to fast, but he did correct people in how to fast. Um, he says, when you fast, assuming they're going to, when you fast, put oil on your face and, uh, excuse me, on your head and wash your face so that it will not be obvious to others that you're fasting, but only to your father who is unseen and your father who sees what is done in secret. He's going to reward you. So you see here, all, all three of these times, um, do it privately, do it between you and God, and, and you'll get your reward. He doesn't say what the reward's going to be. He doesn't say when it's going to come. But trust the Father. He's a good Father. He's going to tell us about that in a minute. God's going to take care of you. You just do what's right according to God's direction, God's law. Yeah, Just do what's right and let the Father take care of that. Fasting, uh, one of the religious practices of the Jews, but other uh, religions do that as well. Um, common practice. Going without eating for a while. Uh, it, it, if you practice fasting, it can indeed be a good practice, religious practice, to help us uh, be more in tune with God. Uh, if you um, choose not to eat in order to spend that time focusing on the Lord. Uh, remember the beginning Beatitudes? Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for what? Wow. <laughs> this is where we are. So if you uh, pause your physical eating, or, or maybe fasting from something else, something that you, you physically need, perhaps, uh, in order that you can focus on God, it can, be a way of, um, it can be a way of getting closer to God, or it can be a way of showing out uh, as a pious or self-righteous per, per person. Um, so we either fast for our relationship with God, or other people, but not both. Uh, the question is, whose praise do we want, men or God? Um, later, in chapter 9, verse 14, John's disciples came to uh, him, Jesus, and asked him, how is it that we, John's disciples, how is it that we and the Pharisees, they fast, they fast often, but your disciples, they don't fast at all. What? Jesus' disciples aren't fasting? And Jesus said, well, how can the guest of the bridegroom mourn when he's with them? He's given them a, a, an, ex an example, a situation. He says the time will come when the bridegroom will be taken from them. Then they'll fast. He said, this is not the time for fasting just yet. He's, he's not teaching people to fast, but he seems to assume that they're going to fast. And when they do, uh, they should know that why they're doing it and what their reward is. Um, that, that it's going to come from the Father, not from uh, being seen by other people. So he, here we are in the sermon. Uh, chapter 5, uh, the Beatitudes, and, and then these six statements about, you've heard it said, but I say to you. And now chapter 6, he begins talking about the, what does right, righteousness look like? Practicing your righteousness. Good thing to think about. How do you practice your relationship with God. Someone this evening was talking about witnessing. To, to me, that's one of the most important ways that we practice our righteousness is by telling others what we're experiencing in our relationship with God. So he's talked to us about these things and now we're going to move on to... Um, Yet another real relationship. We've got 15 minutes or so. So let's jump into chapter 7. Uh, chapter 7 begins very similar to the Ten Commandments. Remember uh, the Ten Commandments, the first of them, first set talks about the uh, relationship with God. Have no other gods before me. And, the, and then uh, the, the latter uh, Ten Commandments, of the Ten Commandments, talk about you know, don't covet and don't steal, don't murder. You know, relationship with other people. And so it is here that I see in chapter 7, he's doing the same kind of thing, 
and that he's talking about rightly relating to others uh, here in the Sermon on the Mount, uh, right religion or right relating to God and how that, how that is connected to our right, right relationship with other people. I, I don't think we can separate the two. We, we talk about the cross and how the, the, the vertical element of the cross is our relationship with God and the horizontal about our relationship with one another. They're both important. Jesus is going to teach and preach throughout his three-year ministry and, and then the rest of the New Testament is going to talk about uh, relating to God, relating to others. We, we have that responsi responsibility. And so I, I have this, this question in my mind about, well, because I, I, I want to be more uh, organized and structured. So wh which, which do I need to do first? Get my relationship right with God, and then I can get my relationship right with people? Or do I, get, do I make things right with people, and then I come to God and say, God, I've, I've, I've made all these relationships right now. I want to get right with you. I say, yeah, to both. I don't think it's one and then the other. I think they're happening, happening simultaneously. That is that um, God begins his work by his grace in my life, this vertical relationship. And, and to me, that's where it really begins, is that he begins to work in my life and he convicts me of my trespasses toward others convicts me to go to that person and make things right. Or if something they've done against me and I want to, he tells me I, I need to forgive. And so they're, they're uh, happening to, to me in, in my life simultaneously, not one then the other so much, but certainly it starts with the vertical in that I, I, I can't really uh, get things right with other people unless I have God's grace at work in my life. I, I don't see it happening. I wouldn't, do, I wouldn't make things right with other people if God's grace weren't at work in my life. So right really relating to God and others seems to work. I, I call it um, recursively. As, as I come before God in prayer, uh, God uh, forgives me. God empowers me by his spirit. And God convicts me about what I said to somebody that I said in a not-so-kind kind of way. And he says, why don't you go have coffee with them and apologize? Th things like that. And so as I go and apologize, God's Spirit just flows all the more powerful in me because I'm being obedient. I'm being like Christ don't judge or you too will be judged chapter 7 for in the same way you judge others uh, you will be judged and with the same measure you use it will be measured to you and why do you look at, uh, at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the plank in your own eye how can you say to your brother let me take the speck out of your eye and when all the time there's a plank in your own eye you Hypocrite. There it is again. Hypocrite. First take the plank out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to remove the speck that's in your brother's eye. Do not give dogs what is sacred. Do not throw your pearls to pigs. If you do, they'll trample them under your feet and turn and tear you to pieces. Don't judge. I, I have heard that used so oftentimes by non-church people, unchristian people. Uh, they want to say, I judge not. In fact, I heard it one time. I'm, I don't know the, the source of it, but I heard one time a uh, few years ago that um, judge not lest you be judged was, was quoted more often than was John 3.16 in the world. Because, I, again, my biased opinion is because we want to be independent and say, well, don't judge me. Who are you to judge me? I, I grew up my dad, um, when I was a little bitty boy, was a barber, but he didn't like barbering, so he went into business for himself, woodworking. And so I grew up making sawdust, playing in the sawdust. In fact, when I was with my four sisters last week, Thanksgiving, one of them said, I don't see how 
all four of us lived, survived, growing up in my dad's business. Because he, uh, he, he made all kinds of things out of wood and had this vacuum system that would suck the sawdust out and blow it out the building. Big old pile, um, 20 feet higher or more. And we'd go out there and play on the sawdust. We, the crazy thing, we'd dig caves in that sawdust. And if that sawdust had, what it sort of like those of you who grew up in the snow, you know, digging a, a snow uh, a cave or whatever, and it cave in on you, smothered to death. And, and my sister said, I, I don't see how we all survived. We, but I do remember, we'd, go up, we'd climb up on that sawdust pile and then uh, hold it and just roll down the salt. Oh, what a mess. But inevitably, somebody's going, I got a salt on the bar. Come help me, help me. <laughs> don't rub it. Don't rub it. Yeah. Mm. I don't know how many times I've come crying. I got salt on the bar. Just a, li- just a little old bitty speck. It doesn't take much. Jesus here, again, he's using what? Some humor, some overstatement, some hyperbole to say, you know, in our relationships with other people, uh, we need to help them get the sawdust out of their eyes, um, but uh, let's make sure that we're taking care of our business, too. Let's don't go to them with a plank in our eye and say, let me get that sawdust out of your eye. That's self-righteous, you know. Got that big board sticking out there, you know. <laughs> How are you going to help me with my speck when you got that plank in your eye? He didn't say, don't help people get out the speck. He said, deal with your business so you can help them get their speck. Judge not lest you be judged. Yeah. What does it mean to judge? Uh, Any of you attorney, any of you have served as a judge? Help me here. But I think of a judge, as I've seen them on TV, um, they, they sit on the bench, right? They listen to the case. They listen to the uh, evidence presented and then they apply the law to the evidence. And then they make a decision, innocent or guilty, right? And if they're innocent, then away you go. You're free. But if you're guilty of the crime that you've been accused of, then comes the next part. You're guilty and the punishment is... That's judgment, isn't it? You've been judged. You've been convicted, you've been judged. Yeah. Uh, so that's the way I think of judge not. It's not a sense uh, in which, um, I'll never forget the time, uh, not too many years ago, when I was working with chaplains up at Fort Hood, and, and we were talking about integrity and honesty, and, and, I, and, and I was working with uh, four or five chaplains, and we were talking about this, you know, how, how to be honest with people, and how so often, you know, we Christians might not want to be real honest, you know, just Speak the truth. And uh, Chaplain, I won't call his name, Chaplain says, well, Chaplain Barnett, you have a big nose. I was offended. But it's fairly true, isn't it? I mean, it's, uh, yeah. No? Well, you're saying that, you're saying that mine's not big because yours is bigger. (laughs) Yeah. To judge people. He's not talking about being... The Bible tells us that we need to be fruit inspectors. You will know them by their fruit, right? Practice your righteousness. Later he's going to tell us to practice your righteousness in such a way that people can see it and they'll glorify your Father. But do it for the right reason. Let it come from the heart. Not in order to, you know, be... Look at me, look at me. But as I serve... Look at the Father. Why are you doing what you do? Why do you go down there and help the homeless people? Why do you do, go to the caring place and serve it? Well, I, I do it because that, that's what my Father would do. I'm just doing, doing what a kingdom person does. Hmm. And so he's, he's, when he says, judge not lest you be judged, he, he's not saying that you're not going to be judged, but know that if you judge... People are going to judge you. In fact, I, I'm, I'm convinced perhaps that um, so oftentimes when I um, judge other people, when I, when I say something, um, that I'm, I'm probably saying something about them 
because I see it in myself. In fact, I, I think that's what he's saying here is that um, by the measure you use, it's going to be measured back to you, right? So don't judge. We're fruit, ins- we are fruit inspectors, but we're not root inspectors. You can see the fruit on the tree, right? I mean, it's out there for everybody to see, but you can't see the roots. Who can? Father. Father sees the roots. We see the fruits. Uh, and it may be that a tree, you can walk up on a tree and it's, Got leaves and branches, and it looks like a lemon tree to me. But next thing you know, the darn thing has grapefruit on it or oranges. Yeah. You'll know a tree by its fruit. You'll know a Christian, whether they're a Christian or not, by their fruit, their behavior. If it walks like a duck, quacks like a duck, smells like a duck, it's probably a duck, right? Yeah. And what did Christy say you smelled like? Well, you're not, you're not a garlic bulb, are you? But you smell like it. Yeah, yeah. Judge not. Don't allow, don't allow other people, including Christians, to tell you, no, oh, no, no, don't you judge. Well, no, we're not judging. But if you, if you can't in... Honesty and truth come to me and say, Kelly, I see something in your life that concerns me. It's unbecoming of a Christ follower. I should respect that. And if it's true, I should deal with it. If it's not, I should convince you that, um, no, you, you're, I don't think you're getting an accurate picture of me. Because I can sometimes, uh, I can sometimes convince people that I'm, better than I really am. You have that problem? (laughs) You don't. I think some people think more highly of me simply because I'm the preacher, right? You put me on a pedestal, but you know the problem with being on a pedestal? You, you, You got further to fall. Yeah. Yeah. Preachers aren't perfect. We are to be salt and light, but we're also to forgive as God forgives us. So um, let's, real quick, remember earlier in the sermon, uh, back in 548, where we finished chapter 8, I mean, chapter 5, he said, be perfect. And I said a while ago that I, I, I think maybe I let us off the hook a little bit about being without flaw. He, God's intent is for us to be perfect. Um, we are to help others live rightly with God. We are to be, uh, as, as, like the scripture says, as iron sharpens iron, so one man sharpens another. We're, we're, to, we're to disciple other people, and you can't disciple people without saying uh, that, that what you're doing is not in keeping with the scripture. You've got to, and that's not judging. That, that's... Um, that's discipling, that's teaching, that's training. Uh, we, we have a responsibility as brothers and sisters in Christ that when you see somebody erring, when you see somebody sinning, when you see somebody going the wrong way, to say, come back, come back. Um, throughout the scripture. Uh, and so he, he says that we have the, that responsibility. Uh, we confront people, but when we do, we ought to make sure that get the plank out of your eye first and we ought to, we ought to have this... Uh, um, appreciation for God's kindness Uh, we ought to correct people uh, disciple them just as the Lord does us right God is God is patient with us Uh, we we ought to remember that the Lord uh, his law about fair play do unto others as you would have them do unto you and we should not pretend to be something that we're not Jesus mm, he has a lot to say about hypocrisy um, but Jesus places uh, this um, thing here about speck and log, uh, to, I think, to balance the teaching on judging. Judge not, uh, and lest you be judged. You, you're going to be judged, but your job is not to judge people, not to condemn people. Uh, that's God's job is to judge people. We can't know what's in a person's heart. I can't know if any of you are truly following Christ, that is, faithing Christ, but... 
God, God does. If someone rejects the truth, uh, talking about throwing your pearls out there, if someone rejects the truth, if you try to share with them the good news, I, I think Jesus is saying, don't, don't keep preaching to them. Um, I remember a while back reading s some uh, church stuff about um, people who come and go. That is, they, they come and join the church and stay for a little while, and then they're... Um, and that we preachers and church leaders can spend a lot of energy trying to get people back. But this author said we might be more wise to spend our time getting those who've never been in the doors rather than those who've been here and chose to go elsewhere. We have the world to reach, and it makes sense to try to reach those who are, well, that God, God has already got his grace out there working on them. They, when, I, when I teach people about counseling, uh, you know, people who come to a counselor for help, sometimes they come because somebody told them to. The court told them to, their husband told them to, or the wife, or whatever. Uh, and some people cause, uh, they come because they really want, they want some help. They want to change. They see themselves as part of the problem. That's the kind of person you want to help, you want to invest. I, I tell my counseling students all the time, don't work harder than your, your, your people do. They have to do the work. And so Jesus, I think, is teaching us, you've got a world to win as the church. Um, get out there and work with the lost folks and um, don't, don't throw these, this preaching out um, to people who don't want to hear it. Jesus was only here three years teaching, preaching. We are here for a lifetime. Let's pause there. At the end of where? 7 6. Next time we'll start at ask and it will be given to you. Make myself a note. Start here. And I told my left hand what my right hand was writing. Mm -mm. Pray with me. Lord Jesus, you have taught us much tonight through your word and through your Holy Spirit. Um, but we know that we want now, we've got it in our heads, we want it to sink down into our hearts and, and uh, flow out through our behaviors as we encounter people in our community this week. Lord, it's the Christmas season. People are thinking about um, Christ, some. Others are thinking about Santa Claus. Uh, Lord, help us to meet people where they are and uh, maybe help them to take one step closer to you. Seeing the reason for the season in Christ our Lord, in whose name we pray. Amen. God bless you. Look forward to seeing you on Sunday.